Bible Salt Book and Stand. Turn to page number 168. Page number 168, Mansion Over the Hilltop. Once you found it, let's all stand together. Page number 168. I'm satisfied with just the cottage below. are making their way. The ushers are going to start making their way on the last verse uh, on Wednesday night, so we have them here because I like these fellas. They're doing a good job. Amen. Thank you, guys. Keep up the good work. Yes, Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be here. Lord, we pray now that you would bless our offering in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Before we're dismissed, uh, we have a prayer letter from the Fetter family, and so I just want to highlight a couple of things. I, want, I like our church, whether it's the teenagers or the young people, uh, to know the missionaries that we support. So the Fetter family are missionaries in Corse, Micronesia, and uh, we appreciate them. They were with us not that long ago, spent some time home in the States, and were able to just recently uh, make it back. And, uh, and so things are going well for them because while they were home on furlough uh, for his wife, uh, well, for Miss Megan, uh, Mrs. Fatter, um, they had to come home on medical furlough and they got some things straightened out, but they also worked on raising some support and all of those things worked out well for them. 
and they were able to pick up some extra support. All right. Uh, so they said that uh, as they return to the field, prices have gone up, much like they have everywhere. And so food, electric, gas, lumber, they said everything is increasing. There was talk, uh, and this has probably happened now that it's July, they were headed to $7 a dozen for eggs. And, uh, and then this was crazy. Two by fours were ten ninety nine. dollars Now, we were mad because two by fours here in the States went to about six bucks not that long ago. They've recovered a little to the $4 range, which is still high. They were $11 when he left, so that's way beyond. They're now 30 per two by four. $29.99 for one two by four. It'd probably cost you about a million dollars to build a home, all right? And so, and they have to deal with that. You know, they're there, and, and it's because of getting goods to that island is expensive. But um, they said God has provided for them. Three new churches picked them up since their return to Corsay. And so we probably shouldn't complain as much uh, because we live in the, at least the land of the free. And, uh, and so we're able to at least get some of these things a little easier at a little less of a cost. I'm sure that that's a triple price increase. And he didn't get a triple. He didn't get triple his support to go there. And I'm sure if you look at across the board, probably their food has more than doubled. Gas prices, who even knows what they pay for gas? It's a little island, so uh, it's hard to get fuel there. But they said they have a youth group on Thursday nights, and it's starting to bear some fruit. Their vehicle had become too small to fit the extra young people, but uh, they were able to purchase a cargo truck. It gives them a lot more room, and they're using that now. And uh, in recent days, a young girl and two teenage boys had been saved in the past couple of months. And so thank the Lord for that. And, uh, and then they were talking about that a newer church member uh, has a boat and he likes to go fishing. So he took the family out. And so for all the fishermen here, uh, Emily is 15. She was here with them. And, uh, and so she went out fishing and she caught a 40 four and three quarter pound uh, sailfish. And so as soon as some of you losers catch up to that 15 year old, uh, and uh, that's, a, that's a pretty good size fish, 45 pounds, all right? That's a small child. But, um, uh, and so he was just, you know, relaying that. Thankful for good things happening on Sunday. The church is seeing a little bit of growth as they sort of get back. Uh, in the swing of things, and, uh, and someone who recently had gotten saved and had some issues has been coming back to the church, all right? And so let's pause for a moment, and let's pray for Daniel, Megan, Emily, and Lauren. Lord, we thank you for the Fetter family, the work that they're doing. We pray now that they would continue to see souls saved. Lord, the prices I, I know are continuing to rise, and probably even since this letter, things have gone up. We pray that things would come down a little bit. But Lord, even if they stay where they are, I know that you're gonna provide their needs. He's not complained, he's not asked for anything. He has given you the praise that you're providing. Would you continue to meet their needs? And, uh, and Lord, if we can do something, you show us what we can do and uh, keep them going on the field. Bless their work efforts, their church efforts, and their family and safety, and all of those things at this time. We thank you for their service to you. And we're glad that we can take a very, very, very small part in it. We'll look forward to meeting these that were saved someday in heaven because of the efforts of these great men and women who have given their lives for the cause of Christ, given up family and friends, and all that they've given up to be on the mission field. God, I pray you'd bless the Fetter family as well as the rest of our missionaries in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's have the young people stand. The believers class is standing. And, uh, and if you'd quietly, let's try to be real quiet, be dismissed in an orderly fashion. Appreciate Miss Emily and, uh, and Miss Julia. They do a good job. They did a great job. The, them kids, when they sang, they all lined up. They stood straight. They didn't fool around. I mean, very, very minimally. And, uh, and I like that. That takes a lot of effort on their part. I think we ought to be teaching kids how to act when they're in church. I think we ought to be teaching kids how they ought to act when they're in public, and it starts in church. And, uh, and so we need to help 
the next generation know that this is a place to be respected, not because it's the church building, we're the church building, but because it is a building. Amen, and there are people here. And so I appreciate seeing them stand nice and neat, and, uh, and they're not perfect, that's all right, but they're working on those things here at the church, and I appreciate the teachers that work with them, and they did a great job. Appreciate those young ladies. Uh, they work diligently with them kids week after week, and they have their problems, but they work through them, and so we, let's be grateful for that. Amen? All right. A uh, couple of prayer needs for you to consider tonight. We're going to move quickly, get right into our Bible study here in just a moment. Oh, the teens. I'm sorry, Brother Elliot. I don't know why I forgot that. Didn't even think about it. I guess I was dismissing one. Appreciate our teen workers. Them kids, they stand up straight and they look, oh, that's right, they don't sing. Losers, lazy loser teenagers. That's the problem. Too many video games. We're going to have a video game uh, competition next week. Oh, all of a sudden they want to be involved. Uh, we're not, by the way, over my cold, dead body. Will we ever have that happen while I'm on duty? But we will have a video game burning. I'm all for that. Amen. Uh, Terry Martin has a bad knee. She's going to the doctors tomorrow to see what can be done. So that's Terry Martin, if you would write that down. Okay, and I'm going to guess that that came from Mrs. Valentine. No signature on here. And, uh, and then uh, Karen, uh, oh, Miss Karen put down that Jennifer has an infection in her leg, spent a couple of nights in the ER. And, uh, and so let's pray for Miss Karen that this infection will uh, clear itself up. She, she's home at this point. Okay. All right. So you pray for Miss Jennifer and uh, as well as Miss Karen. And, uh, and then Jeff, Brother Jeff, his cousin Steve died of a heart attack in Tennessee. And uh, have we met him? Has he been here? No. Okay. All right. And so the funeral's tomorrow, Tennessee. Obviously, you're not going. Uh, and, uh, but nonetheless, all right. So we want to pray for the family. There was he a young man. 62. That's, that's relatively young, right, Brother Jeff? That's young, right, Brother Jeff? Would you consider that young? All right, I think, I thought you probably would. I think of it as young, and so we know that. Uh, okay. Really? Was he healthy? Did he? Okay. Wow, on vacation, out of, out of the area. Oh, okay. They didn't know what was going on? Okay. All right. We'll pray, pray for that family then as well. And, and of course, you know, Brother Jack, Miss uh, Linda just uh, buried her sister a week ago Thursday. A week ago tomorrow. And uh, so... Uh, continuing to pray about that. And then Miss Danielle put down her Aunt Deb, who was here in our tent meeting, a couple nights, one night. She came one night. Your mom came a couple nights. Um, her Aunt uh, Debbie went to the doctors, and her blood pressure was high, so they put her on some meds. They just want to get her blood pressure down and, uh, and get her lab, and uh, just pray that her lab work would come back okay. And your aunt's relatively healthy. I mean, she's been here several times. So, all right. So let's pray for Aunt Debbie uh, in that situation as well. Okay. And there's a lot of other things, I'm sure. If you have a prayer request sheet, now would be the time you want to get that in. Nobody has one. All right. We got what we needed tonight. And, uh, and so let's be mindful. We also got an update on, uh, I think her name is Sue. Yeah. Okay. Sue is uh, Miss Valentine. Uh, not this Miss Valentine, but the other Mrs. Valentine's aunt, the one that fell into the fire. And uh, the situation was not good today. She's really just sort of hanging between life and death at this point. She had a very bad night, and, uh, and so the situation was looking a little bit uh, not good there. So her name is Sue, and, uh, and so we'll pause for, and not that these other things aren't important, 
You can pray for these things as well. We'll pause for a minute and pray for Sue. Would somebody like to do that? Just jump up and begin praying. Uh, that would be fine. All right, go ahead. Amen. All right. Thank you, Mrs. Golem, for that. Yes. He put a note here, and I ignored it. So thank you for saying that. <laughs> uh, we're going to forego that just for a minute. Can we move it? We're going to move it. <laughs> I did see that. He put it here. I just ignored it. <laughs> Sure. All right. Amen. Pray for Brother Paul. He's been doing some work in Ann Arbor. Appreciate him doing some work in Ann Arbor. Amen. So, yeah. Giving out tracts and, and, uh, and, and witnessing to people in some of the common areas around the college. And, uh, and so you can get involved with him if you want to uh, in that. He gladly... Okay. Okay, so Saturday, yeah, Saturday he's going to be down there, and uh, so if you have an interest, I thought he was going to say 7 a.m., and I knew everybody would be out on that. They're pretty lazy. They don't get up real early, brother. Yeah. <laughs> he's, he agrees with you on being lazy. <laughs> so, all right, 7 o'clock. That's good. That's good. The church, the church that I was with a couple of weeks ago, State Line Baptist Church, uh, where the young people that are staying with us for the last couple of weeks, they're, they go to church at State Line Baptist where I was preaching. And, uh, and they go out on Wednesdays and some other times, but a lot of the soul winning we did, they go to several uh, of the cities that are surrounding them, like Ann Arbor, a little smaller, but where people are, would be walking the streets. And they literally just walk the streets, give out tracts and give the gospel. And they had people, five or six people saved in the week that we were there. Uh, and so... Uh, I don't think I mentioned that because of our tent meeting, but uh, yeah, we had five or six people saved, and that was exciting. And every, uh, I think I'm correct on this, every person that got saved was led to the Lord by a soul winner who was training someone for the very first time they were out soul winning. The Lord blessed that every time the preacher would, you know, somebody came and so the pastor took one, uh, I think a lady and her daughter went with the pastor. He led somebody to the Lord. It was her first time ever going. The next day, somebody else, brand new, had never been soul winning in their life, came. Brother John Wheeler led somebody to the Lord with that guy. Man, that guy was fired up. By the way, that guy never missed another soul winning opportunity. He came all, we, we went soul winning Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And uh, he, never, he never missed again. And I think the next day, somebody else, the next day, somebody else. And then I know on Saturday, we had somebody come out for the first time. And uh, no, it was Friday. And Brother Wheeler had that gentleman with him. And they led somebody to the Lord as well. And, uh, and so that was exciting. And then on Saturday, that's right, Saturday, we did have somebody new come. And, uh, and so that was exciting. Uh, it's exciting for new, new, new people that have never done that door knock. We were door knocking on Saturday, uh, but on the rest of the week, we just walked around, handed out tracts, gave out the gospel to people, and I did some door knocking. Uh, we were in an area where there was doors and there was some other stuff. I ran into a very belligerent uh, management lady who was managing apartments, told me to get off the property because I wasn't allowed to do that. And uh, I said, well, I am allowed to do that. And she said, no, you're not. And I said, no, but I'm not. I'm not soliciting. I'm not selling anything. I'm giving it away. She said, it's the same thing. I said, how could selling something and giving something away be the same thing? I'm usually not argumentative, and it's not my church. And she said, well, it is. And I said, okay. And I turned around and laughed because <laughs> I wasn't going to argue with her. Obviously, those are two completely different things. And 
the laws on our side, we're allowed to give out tracts anywhere, even in no soliciting areas, because we're not selling anything. We're just giving stuff away. So the only areas we're really not allowed to be are in no trespassing areas, but legally we're allowed to be uh, in, in no soliciting areas because solicitation is selling something, okay? Uh, anyways, but I didn't argue with her. I left. I left the park, moved on, moved, moved, left the apartment complex, and, uh, and she watched me to make sure that I did. But I had already given out about 20 tracks, so I felt all right about it. It doesn't really matter. Amen? Amen. Why? No, he didn't. He, he's not. He's done. He's done with that. All right, and I and I will take care of that, Miss Jill. I, I did see it. I, I it was a, it was it was. I'm being willful in that I was passing over, but I'll get to it. Okay, is that all right? I knew I knew it would be. Uh, it's not that I have a problem with it. I'm just having a problem with it. No, I'm kidding. I'm not at all. She's wanting to have a meeting with the uh, vacation Bible school stuff, and I, I'm just going to push it uh, a little bit if we can uh, till Sunday. I, mean, I think we'd have a few more people uh, that would be involved with that. All right. If you have your Bible. Oh, yes. Just, um, update on my brother. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he's having a really hard time. Yeah. And he's been having a really hard time. Yeah. And he's been having a really hard time. He's struggling to keep food down. Oh. Okay. He's a constant struggle. Okay. And he's real discouraged. Okay. And he's becoming bitter. And that's not good. Sure. Sure. Okay. We'll pray for, is he out? He's home. I mean, you guys are kind of, yeah, you're just taking care of him. And is that normal? Yeah. It is. As his body gets used to somebody else's immune system. How amazing that we live in a world where you can take on somebody else's immune system, but it has to adapt to your body. So they couldn't do that for the first 6,000 years of human history. It's only been in the last 50 that they've started doing things like that. But the human body is an interesting thing. I'm not sure that we were made to do that, but nonetheless, they figured out a way to do it. Amen. And, uh, and so thank the Lord for that. But just pray for him in these trying times that the Lord would give him strength. I, I could understand how he'd get a little bit discouraged and bitter about that because he just wants to be well at this point. And so pray for It's Jim. Yeah, Jim. Uh, and so let's, let's continue to pray for Jim, all right? Get your Bible, and thank you for the update. And it's funny you did that, because I was thinking about, I should ask you about the update, and I didn't, but you said it, so the Lord knew what he wanted said. Amen. Let's go to Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5 tonight. Give you a simple thought. Just sort of hit this thing and we'll be done. All right, not that we're in a hurry to get out, but nonetheless, Luke chapter number five, and I want you to consider with me, I'm going to draw a phrase out of a verse and then just give you some thoughts here that I hope maybe uh, they can help us. I think anything from the word of God can help us. All right, look with me if you would at verse number four, and I'm going to look at verse four and five. And, uh, and then we're going to go back and look at all these verses, but I want to get my thought here out of five. Uh, Luke 5 and verse 4. Now, when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draft. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. Notice with me this phrase, Nevertheless, at thy word. I just want to talk about that a little bit tonight. Nevertheless, at thy word. Father, tonight we've heard about uh, our brother in Christ, Brother Jim, and he's just not res his body is kind of going through this process of getting used to really what for thousands of years they would consider an absolute medical miracle. And that is, is that the removing of something and the putting of somebody else's uh, really uh, st uh, stuff into someone. They got to have new immune system and all these other things and how you have made uh, the body and how you have also, Lord, given doctors wisdom over the years in coming up with these treatments and therapies to try to help people dealing with cancer and other things. And we're grateful for it. But God, his body's going through a, a very difficult time. 
And I know that you made the body, so there's one thing that you know very well, it is that that you created. We would ask that you might intervene accordingly, give him strength, help him to be able to settle some food in his, in his, in his belly and, and not to get sick every time and just to feel better. And to, Lord, he's getting discouraged along the way. And so bring, a, bring encouragement to him, thankful for his sister being around him. And I know that she's an encouragement to him and give her strength but encourage him and the walls the rest of the family as they try to take care of him and minister to his needs. And then the other things that were mentioned tonight, think about Brother Jeff and Miss Linda, they've now gone through their second loss in less than a week. And to bring strength to the family there and bring healing and comfort as only you can. Miss Jennifer with this infection in her leg, that did a couple nights in the hospital, and we would ask that you would clear the infection up and the medications or whatever they are doing, try to treat that that it would work accordingly, and we, we're, we're glad that, again, the body that you have made, and so help accordingly, and, uh, and this lady, uh, Sue, that is really, if nothing changes, it's possible that tonight would be her last night. Lord, I don't know if she knows you. You know that. She knows that. I pray there's been a time in her life when she has trusted you. If she's not, give her a chance. Lord, just give her a chance to maybe gain some more life and that someone would get her the gospel. But if she is saved, Lord, that thy will would be done. She wouldn't have to suffer and be in pain anymore. We think about uh, uh, Deb tonight, Debbie, uh, and the difficulties with her blood pressure. And Lord, I pray that you would intervene accordingly uh, in that situation as well. And the other needs, because uh, they are all important. Think about this one uh, uh, Miss Valentine put in tonight. Uh, I believe it's uh, maybe her sister-in-law and some difficulty that she's having as well and, uh, and just minister to the need there as well as so many other things. We love you tonight, Lord. Pray you bless now our time together in Bible study and uh, give us something that we can just sort of use in Jesus' name, amen. Nevertheless, at thy word. Have you ever done something uh, or had to do something that you just, you just didn't want to do it? Um, you know, maybe it was uh, something at home. I mean, children, we don't have any up here, or teenagers, you know, the, our chores. But when we were a kid, uh, maybe there was that one thing you had to do, you know, take out the trash. And the, the trash was, you know, down, a, a down around the corner in the dark in the middle of winter. You just didn't want to take the trash out, but that was your job. Can we all agree on, we probably, all of us, when we were children, maybe it was make your bed, maybe it was cut the grass. I, I don't know. But it was something you really just didn't want to do. It was an unpleasant duty. Even as adults, we have these things, maybe in our job, uh, something at work or some, some job that nobody wanted to do, but you went ahead and you did it even though you didn't want to, and it just sort of gets dumped in your lap. And even though you may not have wanted to do it, you did it anyways. And, and here's the question, why did you do it? Why did you do the job you didn't want to do? Maybe you did it out of a sense of obligation. Maybe you did it out of a sense of fear that your parents would whoop you if you didn't do it or ground you or take something away from you. If it was your boss, maybe you did it out of a sense of duty that you knew that, hey, he's the boss, and if he said do this, there's a million, uh, probably not a million, but there's a many reasons why we would do something. Um, maybe, maybe you did it out of respect for the person that has asked you to do it. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, we ask people to do things, and they don't want to do them, but in respect of the individual that is in authority, we just go ahead and do them, right? Maybe it's a teacher, or maybe, again, it's a parent, and we should do things out of respect. But the truth is, is that all of us probably have done things that were unpleasant. All of us have done things that we did not want to do. Jesus dealt with it. He spoke about it in Matthew chapter number 21, where he talked about a, a, a man coming to his sons and saying, go out into my field and, and work. And one of them said, no. And then the other one said, I will. But do you remember the one that said, no, he then repented and he went and did the work. He did what he did. He said no initially because he didn't want to do it. He was just being honest. Uh, but he understood that he was disrespecting the man that had asked him to do that. Disrespecting, I believe it was his father in that situation. Uh, he had two sons and he's disrespecting his father. And so he gets that right. He repents and he goes and does it. The other boy said yes, trying to please dad and never went and did it. 
And so, and Jesus is using that story as which one, you know, was sort of the better in that. But sometimes we do these things. That is the sort of the idea that is here in Luke chapter number five. Uh, it, is a, uh, it is Simon Peter called upon to do something that frankly he really didn't want to do in this particular situation. But remember that it is Jesus who is asking him to do it. And because of that, Peter would comply. As we look at this passage for just a moment, I want us to look at uh, sort of the way that we live our lives uh, on a daily basis. And maybe we need to learn to develop a mindset much like Peter had in this situation. It is this mindset, not necessarily dealing with people, but how about when it comes to the Lord and him asking us to do something, we need to have the mindset that regardless of how you feel on a personal level, if the Lord asks you to do it, it is not about how you feel. It is about a respect for the person of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, and the fact that he has asked you to do something. And we ought to have an obligation to do it, even if we don't feel, quote unquote, like doing it, or feel like it's something that we know how to do, none of those things really should matter if the Lord gives you a command. Does that make sense? Uh, it doesn't really matter. Why? Because you're saying the Lord doesn't know what he's doing. Why did he ask me to do it? Moses came up with that when he said, Lord, I can't believe you'd ask me to go down to Egypt. You know I can't speak. And, I, and the Lord, you know what the Lord said? I made man's mouth. And I made yours, and I know how you speak, because Moses, I've, I've been listening to you talk for 80 years. Now, I'm not saying that to try to be, you know, sort of comical, but the truth is, hey, Moses is 80 years old. You know, I have a stammering tongue. And I'm thinking, the Lord, yeah, the Lord's really dumb. He hadn't heard you in 80 years. I mean, he knows that, uh, but God asked you to do it because he knew that you could get the job done because it's not about your strength. It then becomes about his strength. And so um, when it comes to uh, the work of the Lord, we should be willing to do what God says. And we just need to take the attitude, nevertheless, at thy word, I will. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will. In verses 1 through 3, you would notice that we could consider tonight the vessel. Up to this point in these verses, we'll look at it, and it came to pass in verse 1, that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Here's what you notice uh, up to this point. Here's what this boat has been in these verses. It's been a place of, and I could read further on in these verses, and I'll get to this in a moment. <coughs> this boat has been a place of toil. It's been a place of labor. It's been a place of frustration. It's been a place of failure. And uh, it was used to make a living. But uh, that's all about the change. Here, this boat is used as a pulpit. It's been a place of preaching, not necessarily a place of fishing, not a place of making money, but Jesus, in this case, has gotten onto the boat and asked the disciples to launch out. And so notice with me just a couple of quick thoughts, and then I'll get a little further into the text. This was a place of intimacy in verse number three, because he entered into the ship and he says, launch out, and they thrust out, and he sets down and he teaches the people. So there's people on the shore, he's in the ship, they go out a little bit, and Jesus begins to teach them. When Jesus climbs on board the boat, it becomes uh, what was a place of toil, what was a place of labor, what was a place of frustration, what was a place of failure, what was a place of disappointment, what was a place of disillusionment. You're getting the point tonight. That's what that boat has represented for Simon and his friends up to that point. It's not really anything, oh, it's had positive days, but at this point, it's sort of a negative thing. They're outside of it. But now Jesus gets on board, and now it becomes a place of closeness. Now it becomes a, a place of intimacy or a place of fellowship because Jesus is on the boat, and to launch out into the deep implies that they're on the boat with him. And so he gets on 
they get on the boat, right? It's their boat. He's borrowing it. And he says to them, let's launch out. They have obviously finished what they were doing because the Bible says that they were washing their nets. They had been working. They're cleaning their nets. They must have finished it. And when Jesus gets into the boat, they had probably loaded the nets back into the boat. You would see that come out in the text. And so what has been negative now begins uh, to become positive because Jesus is now on board with them. And they're close to Jesus. Before, they were all alone. They were out there fishing, and it was just them doing their job. They were just laboring. But now Jesus is on the boat with them. This is a picture, uh, sort of, uh, of the church. Uh, uh, and not just the brick and mortar, but the people. What the church makes is church, the church is made up of. And uh, it talks about the church. It's a picture of the church being a place of fellowship and a place of closeness when the Savior... Hey, look, it's just a building when you and I are not here. The lights are off, the chairs are here, the carpet, the air conditioning can be running. It's freezing in here tonight. feels like winter. Amen. Uh, but but the truth is, is that uh, it's just a building. But then you come in, the lights get turned on, and all of a sudden, I begin to hear people begin to fellowship and begin to talk, and the piano begins to play. And this changes from just a building from brick and mortar into a church, and you bring Jesus in with you. I'm not saying he's not here, but the truth is, is Christ lives in us, not in this building. And so when we come in, we bring him in sort of into the boat with us. And now this brick and mortar turns into something special. It is a place of closeness and fellowship, all right? It is a special place because of what shows up. Matthew 18, 20 says, For two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst. Uh, uh, so we see the Redeemer shows up. We see the redeemed shows up. It's a special place of because of what we do here. Uh, the God is praised. Uh, the sovereign God is praised. The Son of God is preached. The saints of God are per uh, perfected. That's all done in a brick and mortar building, but it's when we gather together. It makes a difference, all right? It's a special place because of what we find here. What do we find in the church? We find food for the soul. We find freedom from our setbacks, and we find fellowship with the saints. That's what we should get. I'm not preaching about church tonight, but I'm trying to get the image that this was just an ordinary common boat uh, that was a place of failure and disillusionment, but Jesus gets on board, and all of that changes uh, in verse 3. It was also a place of instruction, because you see that when um, Jesus gets on, he turns this boat into a pulpit. Uh, those on board and those within earshot had the privilege of hearing the voice of Jesus. What a wonderful truth that is. Uh, that, I mean, imagine, hey, it wasn't just the, Jesus preaching to those on shore, but now those disciples, man, they're close. They hear the preaching of Jesus right there. And that had to minister to their needs. I also noticed that it is a place of an invitation. This is where we're going in the story. Look at verse number five and uh, you would find in verse 4, now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, launch out into the deep. He, so he says, Simon, I want you to go off further. We're in the shallows. I want you to go off further than where we are now. And then he says, let down your nets for a draft. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. So it's the place of an invitation. How many of you would agree tonight that um, he said, we've toiled all the night? How many of you would agree tonight these guys were tired? It's now day. They've been working. They were working the midnight shift. They're tired. They're wore out. They're frustrated. They're defeated. Um, the, in, in verse number two, they're not even in the boat. So they've been in the boat and out of the boat. And now they're back in the boat. And you ever been there? You get in the boat and you think everything's going to be all right. And then it doesn't go all right. You get out of the boat. And then you, Jesus says, get back in the boat. You get back in the boat. But you're frustrated when you get back in the boat. And, uh, but now they, he, he, come, he, he gives them an invitation. He invites them uh, to launch out into the deep. They had done everything that was in their power, and all they had found was failure. Everything that they knew to do, it all turned out to just be a failure. 
Sound familiar? Sometimes in our lives, uh, we can find places of frustration. And, uh, but yet, let's think about church again. Sometimes church can be a place of frustration. And, uh, but it can also be a place of an invitation. We come uh, week after week and we sing and we pray and we preach and we testify. And it's good. And we're busy. But something is missing. It does not seem like we're catching any fish, so to speak. We're sort of toiling and laboring. And we've labored all night, Jesus, and yet we've still caught nothing. And even when we come here, we can go. And maybe you feel that way. I don't know if you feel that way. I'm the, I'm the preacher and I feel that way, so I gotta think that other people feel that way. I'm not trying to be discouraging tonight. I'm not trying to get you to look at, at, at being in church as a negative thing, but it can't, we can't be the only ones, or I can't be the only one that feels sometimes like we toil and labor. Look at Maybe you came all last week. Maybe you didn't come all last week. But I don't know. We toiled and labored last week to be here, be faithful. And then we worked on Sunday. And then we worked in the parade. I'm telling you, there was a lot of toiling by some people and laboring that was put in. And sometimes you step away from that. And I don't know. It seems like in our Christian life, boy, you go to these heights. And man, we heard good preaching. And we saw some good things. And it seemed like all of this. And man, you go from here to here just like that. Why? Because frustration, disillusion. Well, we toiled and we labored and I don't see any fish. I'm going to get out of the boat. I'm going to clean my nets for a while. You ever feel like that? Stop lying. You ever feel like that? Amen, preacher. Stop lying. You ever feel like that? Amen. We feel like that, preacher. I mean, yeah, we get like that in our lives. We get like that in our families. We get like that in our, in our personal lives. And then we come here. And be honest with you, we sing and we can do all of those things, but yet something's missing. It just does not seem like we're catching the fish. These men knew how to fish. They knew everything about it. They were fishermen. They were raised in this. Uh, the, uh, James and John's father, Zebedee, was a fisherman. He trained them from the time they were born, from the time they were babies, how to do They knew what they were doing. It didn't matter. It's fishing. We know what we're doing. I know what I'm doing. I do. The more I know what I'm doing, the less I realize that I know what I'm doing, or the more I realize that I don't know what I'm doing, right? Uh, uh, we're experts at everything, and the truth is, is we're experts at nothing. That's true. You know, I, I can raise a family. No, you can't. You don't have a clue how to raise a family. And once your family gets raised, you're going to realize, I didn't have a clue what I was doing. Man, did I mess that up. Uh, and uh, uh, the truth is, is uh, it just seems like we do all these things. But here's professionals, but nothing. We have the right bait. Seems like we have the right tackle. Seems like we have all the right things, right? We still sing out of a hymn book here. We still preach the King James Bible. We still witness. We still give out gospel tracts and try to be a witness in our community. We try to do what's right. What's wrong with our fishing? Don't be discouraged is my point tonight. And we're professionals, but you just can't seem to get them into the boat. And Brother Jeff, sometimes they get in the boat and get back out. And I don't get that one. That one, that, that frustrates me more than the ones I don't catch. Hey, the ones I don't catch, whatever. I'm not a big fisherman. You, you, you people know that. That's just not, I mean, I, I like it. I went last year, first time probably I've went in, in years and years and years. And man, I caught a fish and then I had a lot of fish I didn't catch. And boy, they'd bite the end of the line a little bit. And, you know, I'd do, try to do the right thing and reel it in and I'd have nothing on the end. That didn't frustrate me. What would frustrate me is getting the fish, get them into the boat and think things are going all right and let them hang around the boat a while and then watch them jump back out. I'd be like, well, I had them. I even got a picture with him. Well, where is he? He jumped back out. Those are the fish that bother me, the ones that get in. I don't worry about so much all the ones I miss. I worry about the ones I catch that I can't keep. And, uh, and, and we can get frustrated and discouraged. I don't know. Maybe I'm encouraging myself tonight. Thanks for joining in. Uh, I want you to notice with me, not only do we see the vessel, but look at the voyage in verse number four and in verse number five, it comes out of give you some just real little practical thoughts here. Verse number five teaches us that there was a night 
of struggle. So I'm going to jump around to a couple of thoughts. If you're taking notes, it's going to be hard to do. And, uh, and so what? You don't need to take notes. I'm going to pull a, uh, a jack out. Just look at me. Bless God. Close your Bible and look at me. No, don't close your Bible, please. Amen. This is a Bible preaching. I'm not criticizing Dr. Hiles. He, I heard him say that several times. And uh, he was a much more eloquent preacher and knew the word of God much more than I did. But I, I notice in verse number four, there is a command. Notice that it's two part. What did he say? He said, launch out into the deep and then do what? And let down your net. That's two different things. So launch out into the deep and let down your, what's that next word, class? Nets. That's a plural word, let down your nets for a draft. A couple of observations that I uh, drew out of this verse. Uh, here's observation number one. There was nothing, I like these things. So let them help you. Listen to these things, very simple. There was nothing wrong with the boat nothing you say how do you know there was nothing wrong with the boat because jesus said launch out into the deep mrs golem if i had a boat with holes in it i wouldn't get on it and tell you go out into deep water why because i'm smart because she would look at me and say there's holes in this boat and i would have to then agree that i can't swim now I'm going to rely on you to save my life, and I'm not sure you can swim. <laughs> but in all honesty, do you understand? The truth is that there's nothing wrong with the boat. Jesus is putting his stamp of approval on the vessel. He says, launch out into the deep. I feel totally secure in this boat. So we can understand tonight that there's nothing wrong with the vessel. Number two, here's another observation for you. They needed to go where the fish were. Jesus knew, Jesus knew where not to fish. And he knew where to fish. He, Jesus knew the fish were not in the boat. And they knew the fish were not in the boat, but Jesus didn't know where the fish was. If they were going to catch fish, they would have to go to where they were during the hottest part of the day, and that meant out into the deeper water. They fished at night because the better fishing in this region would have been at night because it would get very hot during the day and the fish would be deeper and they would fish in the shallower waters where it was cooler because that's where the fish would be coming and so that's where they would fish. They would fish in the, in the evenings. But Jesus said, it's the heat of the day. We can't fish up here in the shallows. The water's too warm. The fish have moved out into the deeper water. We've got to go out to where the fish are. Make sense? The fish are not in the shallows and the fish are not in the boat. Jesus said in Mark 16, 15, go into all the world and preach the gospel. There's a reference there to our soul winning. Number next in a list of observations, number three in a list of observations, a net will never fill with fish until it's first let down. In other words, you can have everything right, but not be letting down your net. Whew. I want you fellows to launch out into the deep. What are we gonna do when we get there? We're gonna hang around till all the fish jump in our boat. How many of you know that Jesus could do that? That would not have been a crazy command, Brother Jeff, at all. I mean, look it. He needed to pay his taxes. You know what he did? He said, go down to the water, pick out a, get this fish. When you open it, there's going to be a coin in its mouth. And he said, pay taxes for you and for me. I'm looking for that fish still, Brother Simon. Amen. You and me too, right? Pay them taxes out of some fish. The only thing I get out of fish are guts. I mean, I can't get away from this. People can't hear. But launch out into the deep. And we're just going to sit there and all the fish are going to jump into the boat. Man, that'd be a miracle. But can I ask you something? I don't have this written down as an observation, but it's an observation that just hit me. What would that have taught those guys? Well, it taught them about the power of God. Well, and that's fine. I mean, we should know about the power of God. But truthfully, there was a thunderstorm the other night and it taught me about the power of God. And I didn't go out and play in it. Amen. 
How many of you get what I'm saying tonight? I mean, wake up, man. Pretend like you know what's going on in church tonight. Amen. Help the preacher out. Uh, you, I'll let you preach the message, all right? Just come up here and read my notes. But, I mean, in all honesty, that would have taught him about the power of God. I, I believe that wholeheartedly, but there's more to the power of God than him just doing something powerful in your life. Sometimes you need to do something, and then you experience the power of God, and you're involved in it. And so he said, go out. Let down the net. You've got to get the net involved. It's not going to fish. It's not going to catch until you put it out there. He could have filled the boat. So you've got to, hey, look, you say, well, pastor, is anything good happening? Well, we had a lot of visitors last week. I don't know what's going to happen with that. Brother Chris asked me tonight, he said, Pastor, was anybody saved? And that's not a criticism of him. I said, man, I don't know. I, I, and we both kind of came to the same idea. We said, well, a lot of seed was planted. A lot of good preaching, a lot of people heard, a lot of information. We gave out, I, I don't know, ladies who cleaned out the bags after the parade, uh, but I want to say we probably had, who, who cleaned out the bags? You're pointing over there. You cleaned out the bag. What would you say? We had a couple of hundred left. Do you even think it was that many? You think it might have been a little bit more? Guesstimate for me. 150 to 200? Okay. So we gave out about 1,800 packets of information. And in uh, and, and, and all honesty, we probably missed 150 or 200 people, but man, everybody was working diligently, and uh, it just happens. People come and go, and a lot of people thought the crowd was down the shot. I don't have any idea. It's been a few years since we've done it, and it probably was because people are unpatriotic. It's true. Uh, don't read the internet. And they're saying everybody's unpatriotic now, but... Uh, but the truth is, is that's a lot of information. 1,800. Let's go with 1,800 gospel tracts. Yeah. Eh, maybe some was to a kid, but a lot of adults, a lot of people wouldn't take them. It's the world we're living in now. I've never seen that. I've never had that in the parade. I've never had one person come in the, in the, I think, 10 years we've been doing the parade, probably 10. We missed only a couple of years. And this is, so probably in, in 10 years, that's the first year that we had multiple people say, nope, nope. Nope, I saw someone, they saw her float going by, and uh, I watched them say to their kids, don't, don't take anything from them. I'm thinking, man, we're awful bad people. But you know, what the, you know what I said? I said, I'm not surprised, not one bit anymore. I'm, you know what that says to me? It says a couple of things. Number one, it either says we are saturating our community, and they know what Calvary Baptist Church stands for. Pat yourself on the back. I'm glad. You don't want to take our literature because you get too much of it because you know that we stand for the truth and that, and that we're going to give you the gospel. Don't take it. It just makes me feel like we're doing our job just fine, so we're going to keep it up. We'll saturate them more. I'll find out where the person lives. Go drop a couple of some Some lady sent a thing in there. So she, uh, some, ladies, uh, some young ladies went and passed out a case of Bibles last week, and a lady called and said, don't leave your literature on my door. I'm Catholic. I'm thinking, it's a Bible. You just proved to me exactly where you stand in things. She said, I'm Catholic. I don't need your literature. I wanted to call her back and say, lady, that wasn't literature. That was a Bible. But you probably wouldn't know that because you haven't picked it up in a while. Amen. You say, boy, Pastor, you're awful mean. I can be when I get in the flesh, but I didn't call her up. And she said, don't leave your literature on my door. Uh, I live in such and such, on such and such a road. Hey, give me your address. I'm thinking, well, how am I supposed to know? Oh, wait a minute. I wonder which door is hers. Uh, maybe I'll recognize her voice. I hope we hit her door three or four more times. And she calls every time. Until you leave the address, we're going to keep leaving a Bible. And then I found out it was Mrs. Short. How could you do that, Mr. Short? Trying to claim to be Catholic like that because you didn't want a Bible. The truth is, I'm not trying to be rude or crude. You say, well, you are. I know, it, it's natural to me. I try, I'm trying to get it under control. You pray for me. Well, maybe in my next life, I'm going to get that stuff under control. But uh, I mean, honestly, don't leave your stuff on my door because I'm, I, you're religious. I'm not trying to get you to join this church. I'm just trying to get you into heaven. If you don't want to go to heaven, that's fine with me. I hope your church can get you there. Man, it, it seems like we put the net out. But look, you can't. If we don't put the net out, if we didn't put the Bible out, if we didn't give the gospel out, if we didn't give a track out, well, nobody's going to get saved. Nobody's going to hear the truth. Why? Somebody else in this community going to do it? They're not. Was a Methodist church going to do it down on the corner? Is that, isn't that what that is downtown? It is Methodist. I'm not criticizing them. I've talked to the pastor a few times. Somebody asked Miss LaFave. She said, 
She said, oh, you guys are from the church, and, and you won. She said, you won first place, congratulations, and I was all excited about that. She said, are you guys the church right there on the corner? <laughs> Mrs. Lefebvre went, not us. She went, oh. Dang. I'm sorry, we're such a disappointment. We're not the church on the lake, but if you give us the building, we'll be the church on the lake, and we'll clean up that corner. No more parking your boats and party in there. That's where they all party. Yeah, how many ever go by there? And that's where all of the boat, they were, they were there. Uh, we went to the little uh, uh, a farmer's market right after the parade. They have a farmer's market new here in town, and we went over there and supported the four local business, the four businesses that were there. And uh, we supported one of the Valentine girls by buying some of her cookies and bread, uh, but uh, the Girl Scouts and whatever. So we drove by uh, in town, we drove by there, and there had to have been like 10 boats lined up right out the, outside the gate of that, that church. They were all down there. That's where they party at because they can stand in the water. I'm thinking, I would have speakers outside the church playing like WBOF or KNVBC, just all, they wouldn't park there very long. It's, by the way, it's the church's property. And uh, I mean, all of them, they're down there party. And I, I, I mean, I don't think that they're bad people. Uh, they just found that's a convenient place. I'm thinking, we want that building. Give us that build. We'll take that building. We'll start a second campus in Whitmore Lake. You say, that'd be awful close. I know. We'll just split the church in half. So 10 of us will go over there on Wednesday nights. The other 10 will meet here. And, uh, we'll, man, we'll just, what's that? Which one are you going to be at tomorrow? We're not going to tell you that. <laughs> it's a big surprise. That's right. I'll float between them, and you'll never know where I'll be. So there'll be a nice preacher, and then there'll be me. You know what category I would fall into would not be the nice preacher. And uh, <laughs> that's good. Were you asking because you didn't want to be there? Oh, you wanted to be where I was. I didn't take it that way, but whatever. If you want to lie in church, that's fine with me. Just remember what happened to Ananias and Sapphira. <laughs> oh, good one. Way to try to get yourself into another Bible character that was better. <laughs> but in all honesty, it's back to the Bible. This is serious church business. We don't have fun around here. The nut we got to put the net out there. Right. You look at, I wish, I, 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 I don't even know if I wish, because none of us would be able to have the time to do it, but I wish we had a soul winning program, 365 days a year, seven days a week. We met here, we could go out. I mean, there were people soul winning all the time and just giving out the gospel, but the truth is, is we'll do what we can do when we can do it and get the gospel out to those that we can when we can. It costs us money, it costs us time. Everybody was sweating and hot on Sunday, on, uh, on Monday that showed up for the parade, but I will tell you now that if one person trusts Christ, someday we're gonna get to heaven and it's not gonna be about that you sweat or that you walked or that you this or that you that. They're going to thank you for coming. Think about some young person that you gave that to. They go home, take the candy out, read the track. Mom and dad don't know anything about that. They read that and they trust Christ. That happens, I think, more often than we will ever know. Somebody we're going to get to heaven, they're going to say, you gave me this in a parade. I'm thinking in 10 years, Brother Jeff, there's got to at least be one of those. We've probably... I don't know, Ms. Claire, we average about 2,500 a year that we give out. 2,500 a year, that's 25,000 pieces of literature. 25,000. There are churches around this area that haven't given out 25 in 50 years. We've given out 25,000, and that's just in the parade, and that's a conservative estimate. Maybe I'm high. I don't think I'm high because I think some year we've done more. Think about that. Don't you think how 25,000 times is putting that net down, there's got to be one fish in it. I mean, man, if I went to, if I fished 25,000 times through my line in and didn't catch anything, I would hook myself on the end of the line. <laughs> All right. You got to, you got to, you got to let, I can't keep this church together. The net don't get filled until you let it down. Amen. So there's the command, there's the concern. Peter tells the Lord what? He said, we've toiled and we've taken nothing. Notice these, it's a night of struggle. Notice these things with me. Oh, time's gone. There is the weariness and the woe. We've toiled all night, that's weariness. And we've taken nothing, that's the woe side. You know what I noticed? Jesus interrupted their work. I don't have time to get on these things because I'm being done on time and that's two minutes. Listen. 
in the middle, get this tonight, here's something real practical, in the middle of what they were doing, washing their nets, Jesus interrupted them. That's how he works. He comes and he interrupts your daily life, and he asks you to do something. And we're all the time like this. Well, I've got this going, and I've got, and I've got these plans and that plans. Think about this for a minute. And Jesus says, no, no. Here's what I love about this. Here's what I love about this. They stopped, and they let him interrupt their life. I think our problem is, is we don't stop and let him interrupt. He tries to interrupt, and I don't mean interrupt in a disrespectful manner. Think about they're washing their nets, and he said, fellas, let's go out. And they just did it. He interrupted their work. And then he says, launch out into the deep. And they said, we're weary and we're woeful. We've toiled and we caught nothing. But I want you to notice, here's a statement. What they did, they did in spite of their current circumstance. Think about this. Nevertheless, here's our phrase, nevertheless at thy word, I will let down the net. The word nevertheless just literally means in spite of anything else, I'll just go ahead and do what you say to do. It's not necessarily a term of negativity. It's a term of okay. But notice what he said, I'll let down the net. Jesus said, let down the nets. He said, I'll let down the net, singular. Peter tells the Lord, we have fished at the best time and taken nothing. You know, Jesus said these words. Consider, did I, I maybe not have shared this. I think I might have shared it. I was preaching out. John 15 and verse number five. For without me, you can do nothing. I was reading a book. Uh, I just finished this book. It's a great book. Great book. I'm going to read it again. But the statement, there was a statement in the book he was dealing with this verse, the writer was. And he spun that verse around in such a way that it really made an impact. Because here's what we read that verse. We say, without me, you can do nothing. And we take that verse and say, I can't do anything without the Lord. How many of you agree that that's the way we read that? He spun that thing. And here's what he said. He said, necessarily, when you read it in the context of the verse, it doesn't necessarily, is a twofold meaning. Number one, it's true. We should think without the Lord, I can do nothing. But here's what he said. He said, think about it like this. Anything that you do without the Lord amounts to nothing. Because here's why, here's why he made the statement. I can't do anything without the Lord, but guess what I do? All right, how many of you are with me tonight? I know we're about done. How, what do we do? Well, I can't do anything without the Lord, but I'm going to go ahead and just, I just go on. But if I think about everything today that I've done without the Lord amounts to nothing. You say, oh, no, no, I fed my family. If you did it without the Lord, it's nothing. I mean, I'm glad, but and the Bible says we ought to do that. You understand we're talking about Christian life. The things you do without the Lord, for without me, ye can do nothing. Our lives really are a lot of nothingness. That doesn't mean they're not, it's not important. It doesn't mean it doesn't matter. It matters. It's just the thinking of that verse. I don't have time to preach that to you tonight. But there is the last, stand with me. There's verses 6 through 11 are the victory. There's the vessel. And then he sort of gives them that command, but then there's the victory. The miracle involved fish. If we will obey God, and will work in spite of our nevertheless attitude. God will bless it. There's the miracle involving the fishermen. Because if you notice, and when they had done this in verse number six, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes and their net break. Now, if they'd have done it, what if they'd done what he said, Brother Jeff, the, the net wouldn't have broke. But the fish didn't get away because they beckoned to their friends, and their friends came out there, and then they put the nets that he told them to down. And they caught a great multitude of in the fish so that the ship began, the, both, they filled both ships so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished, that word means to be amazed or surprised, and they that were with him, and all that were with him at the draft of fishes which they had taken. And uh, then he, he's going to tell them, when we get on land, 
He said, leave your nets and follow me and I'm going to make you fishers of men. By the way, in the life of Simon Peter, that happened in the book of Acts in chapter number 2 when 3,000 were saved on the day of Pentecost. He made him a fisherman. You want to know why? Because Peter learned a lesson here from a physical standpoint. He said, man, if I just throw my net, he said, but now I'm not going to throw my nets on the day of Pentecost. Uh, my net, I'm going to throw my nets on the day of Pentecost. I'm going to throw everything I got out there. And God gave a great draft of men. From henceforth thou shalt catch men. Don't be discouraged along the way. Be a nevertheless at thy word. Doesn't make any sense, preacher. Nevertheless, 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 nevertheless. The miracle involved not only the fish and the fishermen, but it involved their future. It involved their future. God teaches us things now for something that we can use down the road. Lord, we love you. Thank you for your people. I pray that the little nugget of truth has been helpful. You helped me. I needed it. Encourage your people. Help us to do what we can for the cause of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we will see you on Sunday. Thank you for being in church this evening. God bless you. Make sure you take your children, your trash. I mean, that's the stuff around your seat. And your children aren't trash. And your spouse is with you on the way out. Or future spouses. You can take future spouses. <laughs>